But I, I love God. I love, I love what he's doing. I love Operation Rescue when it started. It was birthed with a spirit of repentance in her heart. Said, God, it's me. It's not the abortionist, not the, not the abortion mill employees. It's not Planned Parenthood, the ACLU. God, it's me. I am the one that is in sin. Lord, forgive me for not giving a voice to those who are being taken away to the slaughter. Forgive me for not rescuing them. Forgive me for not being like Jesus for them. Forgive me, Lord. It started that way. And as it did, it was a powerful movement. No, because the Spirit of the Lord was there. The anointing was upon us. And then there was real unity. You see, we, we get so busy trying to be unified. It, it almost becomes a God. But unity isn't something you work up. As a matter of fact, the harder you try to work toward unity, the more you negate its very possibility. Unity comes as a gift from God. When we are lost in the vision and mission of Almighty God, He gives us unity of heart. He gives us unity of spirit. And then we become an army which the gates of hell cannot prevail. And that's the problem with conservatism. Let me say this, it's a good statement, is that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ, but they will forever prevail against conservatism, republicanism, against the president, against the Congress, against the packed Supreme Court. They will forever prevail against them, but they cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. So who needs to be the first mover, the primary mover? It's the church of Jesus Christ, but we're way in the background saying, God bless you, brother, and we'll vote for you. And then the problem is once we vote for them, conservatives, we end up having to lobby them and, and pay them to do what they said they were gonna do in the first place. Well, you know, we can win this battle and abortion will come to an end in America. When the church of Jesus Christ makes up her mind, it will come to an end and not one second sooner. The spiritual pattern that has led us to our present abortion holocaust can be summarized as follows. Through the incestuous acts of Lot's daughters, a new demonic foothold was established in the earth. Their descendants, the Moabites and Ammonites, became increasingly subject to this stronghold, leading eventually to the worship of a demonic deity, identified variously as Asherah, Ashtaroth, Moloch, or Baal, with the worshipers practicing child sacrifice. The religion spread as the gods and goddesses of fertility, under various names, were worshiped throughout the ancient pagan world as a part of a widespread Mother Earth cult. The spread of Christianity in many areas began to suppress and eventually nearly eradicate these demonic practices as pagans were converted and light triumphed over darkness. As a result of apostasy and subsequent occult revivals, for example like the one in 17th century France, earth cults, witchcraft, and the worship of the goddess resurfaced in various forms. Witchcraft as an organized religion, was revived in Europe and America beginning in the middle part of the 20th century. And finally, goddess worship has resurfaced in the 20th and 21st centuries as feminist spirituality. And not coincidentally, abortion today's form of child sacrifice has come right along with it. It's important to note the historic rationale of those who in ancient times offered up their own children to idols. They believed that the sacrifice of blood rejuvenated and strengthened the deity to whom it was dedicated, while at the same time binding the spirit to the presenter of the sacrifice. In other words, when they sacrificed their children to an idol, they became spiritual slaves to the demon it represented. Even more frightening was the effect upon the spiritual realm. Greater power was released through the outpouring of innocent blood. The Book of Kings recounts a battle where one of the descendants of Lot's daughters, the king of Moab, was about to face certain defeat at the hands of the Israelites and their larger, though spiritually compromised, army. In a desperate attempt to curry favor with his gods and gain the spiritual advantage, the king offered up his oldest son and heir on the wall of his city as a sacrifice. The fact that it was a burnt offering tells us that it was undoubtedly made to Baal, Moloch, or Ashtaroth. And what is even more sobering, 
is what happened next. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. The sacrifice of innocent blood apparently tipped the scales and gave the pagan king victory over a more powerful army that was no longer enjoying the blessing of God. The Moabite rebellion described in 2 Kings chapter 3 was noted outside the biblical record by, incredibly enough, the very king who oversaw the rebellion. His account was discovered in 1868, etched on the Mesha Stele, more popularly known as the Moabite Stone. Lines 14 through 19 of the stone records, And the king of Israel built Ederot for himself, and I fought against the city and captured it, and I killed all the people of the city as a sacrifice for Chemosh and for Moab, and I brought back the fire hearth of his uncle from there, and I brought it before the face of Chemosh and Karioyot, and I made the men of Sharon live there, as well as the men of Maharit. And Chemosh said to me, Go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night and fought against it from daybreak until midday, and I took it and I killed the whole population, 7,000 male subjects and aliens, and female subjects, aliens and servant girls, for I had devoted them to destruction for the Ashtar Kamosh. And from there I took the vessels of Yahweh, and I presented them before the face of Kamosh. And the king of Israel had built Yahaz, and he stayed there throughout his campaign against me, and Kamosh drove him away before my face. This amazing, yet little known, archaeological find corroborates the account of 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, in particular, this places a burden on those who would claim that the Bible simply made up accounts of pagans sacrificing their children or other humans simply in order to justify their own practices and their own war against these pagan nations. Well, the most obvious similarities are that there was indeed a battle between these two nations. The names of the gods correspond correctly, and it is said that uh, Chemosh drove him away before my face, which does correspond with the record in 2 Kings 3, indicating from the point of view of the king of Moab that Israel had been driven away. Because it says quite clearly, I took and killed the whole population, 7,000 male subjects and aliens, plus many others, females, aliens, and servant girls, was specifically devoted for destruction for Ashtar Chemosh. The king of Moab perhaps perceived that he had uh, secured some of the holy objects of, uh, of the Yahweh religion, and he brought them before the face of his own god as a sort of demonstration of honor and victory. Now, some modern archaeologists will say that Ashtar is simply a variation of Ashtaroth, and that therefore also Chemosh is another variation of Molech. So the Moabite stone does give us clear evidence that human sacrifice was practiced by the Moabites.